I would even say all the problems we have today is because gold didn't succeed. If gold was perfect money, we would have never had all the issues we have today, which is inflation, confiscation, privacy, and all sorts of issues that we have today because we are trusting other people to custody our money, to give us access to our money. The majority of people don't have possession of their money because if they have the money in the bank, it's legally not even theirs. It's owed to them and they can claim it, but it's not legally theirs. It's only their money if, they're, if they actually go to the bank, withdraw the paper, and they have the paper in their hands. But even then, the production of that paper is not backed today by any gold. The topic of today's uh, session is currency debasement and dysfunctional money, basically, how money can be dysfunctional. So uh, I would like to start with the first question that uh, Sina would uh, go through with me, which is, what is a currency debasement and why does it actually happen? Sina. Well, currency debasement is what arguably gave rise to um, development of Bitcoin. So it's it's uh, something that's especially important. It has a lot of implications for how the economy works, how uh, the society works, and uh, how how wealth is transferred and shifted. So one of the easiest ways to define it is to say a change in quantity of money is basically, or, or maybe increasing quantity of money could be called inflation. And ideally, you don't want that to happen because it has a variety of negative effects. Uh, one of them is, well, first of all, inflation means the value of your money goes down. And, and basically, the labor and the energy, the economic energy you stored in your money is gone and somebody's uh, basically taking advantage of that. So there is this direct effect on individuals and uh, it also has societal impacts in creating uh, distributional issues. So basically when you have inflation, generally what happens is those people who earn wage and store in that currency uh, would be hurt the most. And then, uh, and that would generally be the, the poorer people. So. Uh, those at the top, those uh, running big corporations and all, because they have assets, they actually benefit from inflation. So this is basically causing a constant shift of economic energy and economic value from the poorer parts of the society to the wealthier part. And this is a, a highly destructive process. Other, other issues of this debasement uh, is related to ca economic calculation. So any business entity must be able to plan for future based on what they understand uh, about the value of money today versus tomorrow and how much a future investment should return to be a good investment, right? So that's how business entities make, make decisions. Now, if you, if you mess with money um, and basically make it such that uh, it, it loses value over time, then suddenly a, a project that yields zero economic value but only helps to keep your money's value over time, that, that project suddenly seem profitable. And you will see that in nominal terms, you're earning money, but you're just keeping up inflation. And uh, the one example would be just buying uh, so buying a yacht or buying uh, a house so or what something. Does that mean? Suddenly these Sorry. all become economic. What exactly do you mean by nominally uh, your money becomes more valuable nominally? Can you can you explain that a little bit? What does that exactly mean? Yeah, so basically if I invest $1,000 today, the core premise is that that investment will create additional economic value. For instance, I, I go buy a, a higher technology. 
I buy a better machine that allows me to harvest more uh, in my farm. I buy something that allows me to be more productive. So $1,000 spent today will create maybe $2,000 five years from now for the society. So that's capitalism. That's, you know, that's, uh, you know, I, I accumulated $1,000 of capital. I put in, put it into work. I invest it. And that creates more value for the society. That's how the economy grows. That's the normal way. But if, um, Money is inflated such that a thousand dollar today is equivalent to two thousand dollars five years from now. If that's the case, then your investment that did it basically yielded nothing. It only kept the value of your dollar, right? So the difference between good and bad investment goes away. A lot of bad investments seem good just because the dollar value of that investment goes up over time. But that's not because the investment is actually creating wealth. It's because somebody is messing up with value of money. And uh, uh, like I said, a good example is just buying a piece of land and doing nothing with it, right? So you have created no value for the society just owning a piece of land. You didn't farm anything in it. You didn't produce anything. You just kept it. But if you do that, you will see that over time, you're actually making dollars. The dollar value of that land goes up. and uh, and it seems like you know you're you're getting wealthier, but I, what but what happens is you're just keeping up with the inflation trend, and and nothing is really added to to the output of your. Uh, so why your, is that your something activity. bad, right? I mean, if I'm an average person and you tell me this is happening, if the houses become more expensive because there is more dollars in the economy, why is it that? we call this a currency debasement and uh, why is it bad for the holders of that currency? Can you maybe explain that a little bit? Okay, so, so you know, fundamentally, what it causes, like I said, is it, it messes up with economic calculations. So a lot of these uh, economic entities that are supposed to generate value and invest and improve society and add more to the output, uh, they stop doing that and instead uh, get into speculation business and buy a lot of these hard assets that go up, up in price. So that's the first, first problem that it causes. Second problem is uh, this activity causes the normal use of those assets to, to be uh, impaired. If suddenly houses are like double or extremely more expensive than before, as we are seeing currently, the regular user of a house, which is a normal person who just wants to live wouldn't be able to buy it so uh if you do the same so thing with a natural demand in that case would be completely uh punished because he just wants the house to live in it not to buy it because it goes up in value he wants its use case he wants the utility of the house he gets punished absolutely so something that had utility now becomes money and then uh, the utility value of it is uh, impaired. So basically, you get the society where like, the poorest le levels of the society are aren't able to buy assets anymore, and they will uh, end up being renters, and that's a cycle of staying poor and not accumulating wealth, and you know, constant shift of the value to from these from these groups who can't accumulate wealth anymore, and their their the, the value of their uh, wage is now being shifted to to the owners of those assets, and and lastly there is this you know your savings losing value. So generally, uh, again, regular people are in hedge funds. They aren't. They don't have the the time to invest in uh, you know making optimal decisions in, in investment and all. So one of the easiest way for people to uh, accumulate wealth is just keep cash. And if you get a bit more sophisticated, you maybe you also enter some, uh, you know, create a por portfolio with with some bonds and stocks and all. But uh, one thing you cannot change your wage. You are dependent on your your the value of your wage compared to all the commodities in the economy. So when you have inflation, suddenly everybody's wage is going down. Anything you store in the currency is going down. And you don't even realize it. And what happens is most people are like, yeah, this is something that just happened. I mean, inflation is a fact of life. We, can, we don't even know who to blame for, right? So it's very easy to get away with 
it's very easy to extract value from the society in that way. So how does that even happen, though? How has this problem uh, became even a possibility that this is even uh, something that can happen in the first place? Yeah, so uh, that's the key question, right? Um, and basically, we get zero education and training in, in money. Even if uh, you are you know, trained as an economist, you know, a lot of people don't have this fundamental understanding of of how money works and what it what it's supposed to do. Uh, so basically, money is is a promise for future trade. What happens is, in a, in a society, uh, maybe we can go back to the basic primitive society where uh, you know you're hunting or gathering, right? Mm-hmm. So yes. uh, you know, in the beginning, you you could see families that generate food for themselves so they are they're good enough they can hunt or gather and and and, uh they find the food they need uh within the family Uh, there's no trade here and everybody is self-sufficient good enough right then what happens is humans learn and improve and something called economies of scale occurs so people learn to uh, do a better job in hunting So suddenly, once they develop some certain tools and certain methods of hunting, and when they specialize, like one person discovers that they are really good at it. So instead of doing a combination of hunting and gathering, they say, okay, I'll just focus on hunting. I'm really good at it, and I'm going to improve my productivity a lot doing this. I can can increase my the food that I'm creating by 3x or 4x, which is really good. Um, So then your society becomes... A society of experts some people do a certain thing the other people do the other thing and each of them get better and better in doing that and they get a lot more productive Uh, if you do all kinds of things you can't do that right so you have to specialize and specialization brings economies of scale and that brings surplus so then suddenly you have a family that has a lot of um meat um but doesn't have a lot of grain right so And then there's this other family that discovered how to do farming or growing grains or maybe gathering them more efficiently and discovering the the, the sources and all, developing tools for that. So now they have a lot of surplus uh, of of that grain, for example. And then this creates the need for these two groups to trade, right? So uh, I have a lot of meat. And, and the value of those units of meat aren't equal to me. The first unit is very valuable, I'll depend on it. Second unit less, third unit is even less. Last unit, I don't even, I don't even have a use for it. It's just gonna go bad, right? However, I have a lot of uh, use for another unit of grain. So um, I have all the incentive in the world to give you my extra beef or meat and get uh, one unit of grains back. And what when that happens is, the meat that was useless to me ends up being very useful for the other person. So this trade, actually, what it did is it got rid of the stuff that I didn't value and gave me the stuff that I value. So basically, both of us, both sides of the trade are now uh, better off. So the economy grows. what What happens, though, if I trade with you something, but I don't want to consume it instantly? I would like to consume it... Uh, sometime in the future, what what can I do then? Exactly. So for this trade to work, we need to have something like coincidence of wants. So um, basically, you should be right there, uh, available to give me the same thing, the, the thing that I want, so that I trade my my uh, meat with you. So uh, let's say I don't want your grain; I want something else. Maybe I want a tool, right? And you don't have a tool, so we wouldn't be able to basically have a trade uh, or in this case, this is a barter basically. And and the economy wouldn't grow. So the, all the benefits that would come from trade would be nullified this way. So then people invented this thing called a token um, or what we call money now, right? Something that creates a temporal distance between trades. So for example, I can give you my meat, and if you, in return, give me a uh, 
something valuable, let's say a piece of gold um, uh, or a rock or limestone, whatever we value in that society. And then that limestone is also accepted by, I, by other people in that society. Uh, I can give you my meat to you with no expectation of any anything in return except that limestone, right? In future, I can take the limestone to the market and get whatever it's worth back. Now, all of that depends on my, my limestone uh, being tradable in future. So saleability and tradability in future is a key component of money. And, and in essence, this is an account system. I just recorded how much I had produced for the society by owning that limestone. So this is an accounting, basically owner, ownership of that shows that this person has created so much value for the society in the past. And in future, people would be able to uh, trade similar value uh, for that token. Um, and uh, basically that physical token becomes the, uh, the accounting Formal system. Money. Yeah. Now, what can happen is the operation of that token and the, the creation of that and, and circulation of it is what causes all sorts of problems. If um, we had a fixed number of limestones in our, in our tribe, uh, there wouldn't be any problem because you know I, I, I can produce something today, get limestones and tomorrow um, I, can, I can take it to the market and get the same amount of material from other people. So basically, we, we fix the temporal coincidence uh, that needs to happen in trade, and we create a separation between uh, me selling something and me buying something else uh, over time. Uh, now, what can happen is this chain could break, especially if somebody messes with money. So if the value of money changes over time, um, the, the economic value of created today in exchange for that money cannot be uh, is an equivalent to that money a few days from now or, or a few years from now. And basically that that's when the money becomes dysfunctional and, and it loses its value. So 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 the the very first reason why pe people used the token that you just described was essentially because they quite naturally came to a <clears throat> consensus decision altogether on a decentralized basis, everyone for itself, everyone for himself or herself, that if they did not want to consume something instantly, they would rather keep something else that can hold the value that they provided in order to receive that value back sometime in the future. So therefore, they would choose something that no one can arbitrarily produce or easily produce. But also, not only that, they would rather choose something that is very easy to transport or relatively easily transportable and also durable, right? Because if they would choose something like a tomato to store value over time, that tomato will probably lose its value after a week or two because it's going to rot and it's completely um, valueless, right? So tomatoes are not a very good store of value, but rather something that cannot rot, cannot be massively produced through technologies. And therefore money is then an imagined token that could have any form or shape in an economy that people agree upon because of certain characteristics or properties. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So basically um, uh, the consensus comes very early in the use of the money. Uh, so how that works is basically uh, if, I, if I agree to get grains from you in exchange for my meat, if I don't have a need for grain, I will only accept grain if I know that tomorrow I'll be able to sell that grain for something else. So immediately, um, what I will accept as medium of exchange is something that is uh, globally wanted by my tribe. So I'm sure that most people in this 
uh, tribe will buy this wheat or grain from me in future. So automatically people gravitate towards something that's saleable, right? And that's what actually allows me to trust in the money to be able to, you know, uh, to be to be exchangeable future for some other good that I need, right? And everything so, you said basically uh, mm-hmm. are the factors that determines money's saleability. If it if it rots, if the grain is 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 not usable a year from now, it's not a good 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 money, right? Or if um, the demand for it is changed uh, over time in a significant manner, it's not good money. Um, if it's not portable, if it's hard to move it from one place to the other, um, it, again, tomorrow's sale- saleability is impaired. So basically, all of these are, you know, uh, micro factors that determine the money, money's ability to perform that that function, and and do good on the promise, which was future trade. Yeah, I mean, I think it's quite fascinating to think about this or to uh, talk about this because this is a topic that is not taught in any school. I mean, you're a professor. You have uh, been in the academia world for some time. Is that taught in in, in schools at all? Um, Not at all. Not at all. All of this actually was new to me once I learned about them i mean you pick up uh ideas here and there but um you know just a sim- simple things as what is a function of money that that's that's not discussed and especially um the general thought in economics is uh, money is a veil and uh, economic activity is separate so maybe we can just not think about money and focus on the economic activity yeah it's, uh, it's which just, is okay it's- it's taken it, it's taken for granted right that money is available and it just works that's what is assumed which is okay as long as the form of money everybody's using is working right but once things start to break down uh, if you don't start to question things then obviously you can um, get wrecked right? You can completely lose uh, everything you've worked for all your life because ultimately we value things for ourselves and our families for the time we spend, right? That's why we go to work. That's why we produce. That's why we specialize. The whole purpose of an economy of being even alive on this planet is to uh provide goods and services to others and consume goods and services from others. And if we don't want to do that on an instant basis, we would like to rather do it in the future once we cannot produce goods and services, right? That's what money is for. However, back to my question, how is that problem that we discussed, which is basically a dysfunction of an, a form of money, how is that even possible? So we said that a, a form of money must be scarce, transportable, um, durable, divisible, fungible, which means basically exchangeable, right? One unit equals one other unit. Like a bicycle is not very fungible because one bicycle could have a better performance than another bicycle, right? So um, it must be fungible. And um, we've tried many forms of money, right? We've tried seashells, we've tried salt, we've tried gold, we've tried silver. And the only thing that succeeded over hundreds of thousands of years was the one that no one could uh, massively produce because even salt after a while people found a way to massively produce it. The only thing that they didn't find a way for was gold. I mean, gold is still being produced, not literally produced, but mined out of the ground. Um, So it's not perfect, but it's the best thing we could find, let's say, in the real world to use it as a token. But, but, But 
still today we don't we don't trade with gold right we we trade with paper or not even paper we trade with some uh digital promises and we do it through intermediaries so to tell us what happened there what happened right so again going back to the central premise yes. money is a promise of future trade right so um gold was great over time people gravitated to 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 hard money as we call it uh, which was gold because you know once you have a portfolio of things you can use as money over time you will see that certain other types of money are are not as good or they're losing some of their value in terms of you know saleability uh, uh, or durability and, and uh, portability and things like that but uh, gold was the best among those however to support global trade gold was not sufficient it had a few issues one is that uh, its portability is, a, is an a, is an issue right so you can you can move physical uh bars of gold to to do trade that easily over over geography gold loses value so if you if you take gold from turkey to us uh once it arrives there all the costs of transportation might translate it to a loss of five percent or ten percent in value so it doesn't hold its value over space although it does a good job holding its value over time. Other issues with that is like verifiability. Once you want to accept physical gold, you have to test it and make sure it's it's the real gold and it's not combined with uh, some other, other things. Uh, so all of these factors caused us to not be able to use the physical gold as medium of exchange. So then people discovered, and this has actually has, has a long history, but uh, uh, it got accelerated when, when we agreed on using gold. And the idea was that if we issue some sort of bank note that's transferable or um, uh, yeah, tra trans or exchangeable for gold, then maybe we can use those pieces of paper instead of the gold and then fix the transportability. So if we are, if we are you know, trading with one another, I don't have to move gold to you i'll just bring my papers or certificates uh which guarantee your ability to go to the bank uh tomorrow and and give them the certificate and get gold back which then allows you to uh tree you know trade in future so saleability that the promise of future trade would be satisfied and later people discovered why do i even need to convert that certificate into physical gold that's that that certificate itself became the second layer of money right so, and then it, so, it, so the premise that people or gold bucks say money has to have intrinsic value is absolute nonsense right because we 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 we, we just we just discovered that no one actually cares if the form of money has any intrinsic or physical uh, intrinsic ness in it, right? Because yeah, that is a, that is a, a, an absolutely misused terminology. What what do you, what do you mean by uh, intrinsic value? There's a lot of different ways to think about it. First of all, intrinsic value is not value in the molecules of something, which is like a lot of gold bikes are kind of getting confused over. It's not like gold molecules have something that makes them valuable. Um, like i said money is a ledger it's an accounting system anything that allows you to do that accounting well is going to work it doesn't have to be shiny or yellow or anything else any uh, it needs to have monetary functions and it happens that gold does those monetary functions well and if you have something else that does these issues better and it doesn't even have any molecules associated with it it, it can be fully digital it would still work well as money. But uh, I will make the point, what is that intrinsic value that commonly is talked about? That comes from uh, uh, basically Mises', Mises uh, regression theorem. So his argument is, uh, uh, was that money has to be something that is first very valuable. So like I said, going back to our original trite, um, I will accept wheat, uh, even if I don't need it because wheat is accepted in my tribe by everybody else. Why is it like that? Because it has value for the people. 
And, and wheat is something that everybody will need and accept uh, later on in exchange for other things, right? So if, it, if, it, if there is money that's saleable, if there is a commodity that is completely saleable, it's wanted by the whole tribe, that's what we can call some kind of intrinsic value, or, or maybe it's just value. Um, and uh, that uh, is a good can. That makes the, the commodity very good candidate to be money because it, it, it makes it saleable, right? Uh, same thing happens with uh, gold or any other, you know, or kind of jewelry or diamonds that people have used as money because it is highly wanted it makes it a good candidate to be money. And that's what we can call a commodity first being very valuable and then becoming mm -hmm. money, right? But that value is not a physical uh, attribute. It's not in the molecules. It's, it's nothing it's in the user's eyes. So let's, let's go back to this issue of uh, having the problem of the form of money being massively manipulated. How, how does that happen? So we just concluded that gold was the only form of money over th hundreds of thousands of years that was able to uh, scale properly. Uh, but the problem was that it couldn't scale uh, over space, right? You could not send gold as easily as you could uh, send other stuff um, like paper, for example. So we came up with the idea of why not trust some form of entities who take custody of this gold and they give us promises and guarantees that we would get our gold back whenever we want. And then that form of money became ultimately the form of money we use today, which is basically just paper. Um, so, so the problem was actually, I would even say all the problems we have today is because gold didn't succeed. If gold was perfect money, we would have never had all the issues we have today, which is inflation, confiscation, privacy, and all sorts of issues that we have today because we are trusting other people to custody our money. We trust other people to give us access to our money. We actually, the majority of people don't have personal possession of their money because if they have the money in the bank, it's legally not even theirs, right? It's, it's owed to them and they can claim it, but it's not legally theirs. It's only their money if they if they actually go to the bank, withdraw the paper, and they have the paper in their hands, but even then, the production of that of that paper is not backed today by any gold. So, the first thing that made money even money, which was the scarcity, what we discussed at the beginning of this conversation, is not there today, right? So, the form of money that everybody is using is just a trust to that intermediary not to abuse its power and hopefully not massively print it and take custody of it and give us access whenever we need to. So th that's the problem, right? Because right now we have issues that we have inflation year over year on goods and services and on assets because there is a certain number of people who decide how much money there is in the economy. I mean, physical money was, was really good. It had perfect privacy. It wouldn't record who owned it before. Yes. And um, it, was a, it was final. Just ownership of that piece of uh, material would prove that you own this much money. And then uh, you just measure the amount of it in terms of weight. Uh, to see how much uh, value each person owns. So the, the, the accounting was very well done in there. And as long as the quantity of that uh, commodity didn't change, the accounting worked very good. Um, so if we were unable to produce a lot of that commodity, which was the case with gold, um, uh, you know, the amount of wealth I've stored in, the, in that gold or I've exchanged for that gold uh, would stay stable. Uh, but that mm -hmm. obviously wasn't the case with a lot of other kinds of money, which people tried, but they, but failed because uh, those those uh, things were easy to find. 
Uh, now, people conversed on gold because it was scarce. It was hard to produce. Yes. Once we decided that we want to use paper instead of gold uh, to fix the transportability and verifiability issues, then we kind of removed this power. And, and, and basically, we first saw that gold's physicality was great for some functions of money. But over time, we discovered that actually that physicality is is causing limitations in trade so we said yeah. let's trust somebody uh and in exchange for that trust we get some some form of money that's uh transportable and easy to use in 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 trade and holds value over space okay so fiat money is probably the only thing that is good for is over uh, you know in transaction over over space it's easy to send money with it now the only problem is we got trust back for loss of uh, physical guarantee and scarcity. And, and if you know anything about humans is that if you give them a lot of power and, and, uh, and, uh, and there's a lot of value at stake, they're going to misuse uh, and, and abuse that power. So what happens is, you know, the, we created a paper system. Anyone in charge of that paper system can create new money and our assumption is that you know we have democratic systems in which uh, there are uh, protocols and accepted procedures for creation of new money but because there is so much value and and so much at stake the system gradually transforms into one that allows money printing to the benefit of people on top and that's basically what what we call the Cantillon effect. Uh, so when you which create makes sense, money, right? This happened to any form of money in history. This, this is, I mean, a lot of people think this is something new. This is a new phenomenon. Just, just, just because we didn't live through a complete currency or mo uh, monetary collapse, doesn't mean that this has never happened before. People just lack uh, historical education to understand that. There has never been any form of money that has survived uh, empires, uh, uh, empires after empires. The only thing that did survive was gold, physical gold, right? For for the reasons we just discussed. Exactly, because unless you're God, you wouldn't be able to create gold, and that was the only reason that made gold work. But anything else that uh, was in hand in the hands of a human being. Uh, was abused and will be abused. Uh, same thing with the... Quite naturally. Yeah. I mean, if, if you told me I can produce the amount of money that everybody is using, I will print more for myself than others. Honestly. Who wouldn't? Yeah, why not? Yeah. Right? And, <laughs> and basically, so if you do that, you'll probably feel bad. And but, but there's a way to fix that. You can come up with an economic theory that says... It's actually good to create that money and 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 distribute it uh, in the society. It causes you know economic uh, economic activity. It raises the animal spirits, and it's actually a good thing, right? So we solve the moral problem for ourselves as well, and now we can print money as much as we want, and it's actually you know a service to the society. Uh, that's why Keynesian economics uh, you know picked up and was was very popular with governments around the world because it gave them the reason they wanted to print money. Yes. Okay, so let's let's come to the last part. Uh, why does Bitcoin fix this problem? Let's keep it short because uh, we we don't have much time left. Just 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 briefly, why does Bitcoin fix this problem? I, I always like to put it in a way to say that Bitcoin basically does everything that gold did for hundreds of thousands of years and at the same time does everything that humans tried to do with abstractions of gold to scale it together. Absolutely. Right? That's a great way to put it. I like it a lot. We touched upon this in a few minutes ago where we said the physicality of gold had a lot of positive things. However, it also created limitations in trade. And that physicality exists everywhere. Like, for example, if you have a concert, right, you have to be physically there to enjoy it. 
right? So, so that so so the value you produce is limited because it's physical. But if you transform that music into digital music, you abstract away the physicality, and with that, you remove all those limitations. So suddenly, your music can be transported everywhere in the world within one second, uh, and and with very low expense, with very low cost, and uh, its value suddenly becomes you know 100x, 1,000x. Same thing uh, happened with money with Bitcoin. And that was something we couldn't do because with money, we needed scarcity. With music, you don't need scarcity, right? But uh, scarcity in digital world was something that uh, was very hard to come by. And that's the, what Satoshi's invention gave us and uh, basically allowed us to have a gold which, doesn't, which is not limited to, uh, to the laws of physics in certain ways. So it can be uh, it can be transported very fast. It can be verified immediately because it's just math, uh, and uh, it's programmable. And its quantity could be fixed or or, or uh, changed program programmatically with no involvement of humans. So basically, we got rid of all the potential problems that gold would have had, or even fiat currency would have had, by turning by creating this digital gold. So basically you need durability because it's math, it's infinitely durable. As long as there is a single computer with a copy of the blockchain in the world, um, the, the account access system is there and durable. Uh, divisibility, because it's math, you just divide it. You don't have to, you know, come yeah, it's up just, with a smaller- Yeah, it's just a number, thing. right? It's just a number on a computer. Exactly. You can divide and it as much as you want. Divide it into very very small you know uh bitcoin is divided into satoshis and even if you use lightning you can you can do milli satoshis so infinitely divisible uh and then uh, obviously portability is not an issue i can send anything i want any amount and it doesn't change the cost at one dollar worth of bitcoin or a million dollars worth of bitcoin would be the same uh, almost the same uh, effort and cost uh, and immediately verifiable on the other side, and the scarcity is guaranteed. With one, with one little line of code, I can exactly, uh, uh, you know, I can make sure that no new Bitcoin is created outside of the protocol rules. And the only thing really that Bitcoin lacks is is uh, the net, the, the size of the network, which which is a just function of time. As it gets bigger and bigger, its ability to function as as a medium of exchange uh, grows higher and uh, higher, and more entities in the economy will be incentivized to accept Bitcoin just because more people have already accepted it. So this network automatically grows exponentially, and and that's the only thing sitting between uh, Bitcoin as it is today and becoming a global reserve currency and de facto so, money of the world. So the, the conclusion out of this discussion is we have a monetary problem, which is governments control the money supply. And uh, we cannot save that currency because it's not scarce, because it's not linked to anything else but governmental decisions. Governments have a lot of incentive to print it because of debts, pandemics, wars, whatever. They don't only have reasons today to do so. They also are highly incentivized to do so because the people who can bribe get the money first, right? Who are on the top. So everything speaks for more printing and it is mathematically not even possible not to print at this stage anymore because the world has so much debt that's the problem now how do we solve this problem we convert that currency that we get paid for our work and we convert it to the most scarce to the most durable 
and transportable form of money that has ever existed, which is Bitcoin. And we just hold it and wait until other people find out what this thing is, right? That's how, yeah. <laughs> that's the solution, basically. Yeah, and basically- It couldn't be, oh. it couldn't be, it couldn't be said more simply than that, right? It, it's that simple. Exactly. And, and, you know, most technologies grow like that in the beginning, their value isn't recognized. And especially, uh, you know, something like Bitcoin that is money and because of being money, it has network effects and it has a second layer of network effect because of uh, its programmability and all the other applications and uh, utilities that could be built on, on top of that. So yeah, it has but huge... Sina, but Sina, that's one thing. It has network effects. That's, that, that's one thing. But I think what we just discussed and what actually proves that Bitcoin will win over the long term is the fact that there is no other place to go better than Bitcoin, right? There is just no other store of value that people can use to store their time in for their future as good as Bitcoin exists today there is just nowhere else to go everything else is just a worst form of uh, bitcoin and we learned over time people choose the best form of money over time right if people want to save for the next three years maybe they can choose something like the dollar the dollar is somehow stable for maybe a couple of years right you're gonna lose maybe 10 percent, 15 percent of your wealth but you know, it's it's somehow still stable. You can pay everywhere with it. It's it's a good medium of exchange. For that, you can you can hold something like dollars. But if you want to hold something longer than that, you have to look around to find something else. And the best form of everything else is just Bitcoin. The reason everything is going to emerge and that's why everything is going to converge onto Bitcoin over the long term, right? Yeah, you could argue that gold gold was also something useful, but they also took that from society. I mean, it's been confiscated several times, but now even you know, if you if you want to buy a, a lot of gold, uh, physically buying it is is, is very difficult. Uh, so instead, they allow you to buy paper gold, which is also heavily manipulated and inflated away. So, uh, yeah, you know, it's not bonds gold, are horrible. Right? It's not gold. Exactly. So, yeah. so basically, any other kind of property is something you do not truly own, and they let you to own. Like if it's if it's treasuries, it's it's somebody else's debt, and it's a function of their ability and willingness to pay. If it's land, you are subject to the local laws, uh, which can impair your property significantly. If it's stocks, it's just you know just a piece of certificate that tells you you have a part of this company, and that could be changed overnight. I don't know any kinds of other money you think about. You, there is no true ownership. There are always intermediaries, which will take advantage of their position they're in. Quite naturally, because they're human beings and they're greedy. Absolutely. Uh, there's no <laughs> doubt in that. Yeah. Wonderful. Sina, a long session. We had a Persian session before this session. So I would say I think we covered pretty much everything. It was a very, very basic, fundamental discussion. Thank you for your time. Uh, for everyone who is listening on Clubhouse, uh, just give us a follow on uh, Clubhouse, you can click on the green little uh, logo, which is Big Guide. You can follow the club. You can follow me. You can follow Sina. So whenever we do these rooms, you get you get a notification. You can also follow our YouTube channel. I've pinned it into the room. You can follow us there if you want to see our faces while we talk. You can do that. We're trying to do these rooms every week in uh, both Farsi and in English. And as mentioned, we're working on some amazing courses to educate and to teach people about the importance of Bitcoin, how it can change your life and how it can embrace you and your family and your, your, your future self. Thank you. Take care, everyone.